Good morning. Hey, welcome to Mission Point. Let's all stand up this morning. It is awesome to see everybody here in the house of God today. We got a house full of kids and teenagers in here today. The Lord is good. All right, it's Missions Month. This is our theme song for Missions Month, Testify to Love. awesome today, isn't he? It's a good thing we picked some hymns today that we actually know. Uh -huh. Yeah, hopefully we know. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to
Are you thankful for just life? Maybe you're thankful for your family this morning. Or maybe the roof over your head. We used to sing this song in church when we were younger. It was always funny. And we'd always get the words mixed up. And Tom will know the exact song I'm talking about. But we'd always get the words mixed up. We'd say, um, there's a roof up above me. I have a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and there's shoes on my feet. And I used to always mess that up. And I'd always say there were, there were shoes on my feet and, no, sorry, food on my feet and shoes on my table a lot of times. But this morning I'm so thankful just to be a Christian for what he does, the simple things. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow and uncertain times. I'll be honest with you, don't ever ask me my political viewpoint. I really don't care. Can I be honest with you? I don't know what tomorrow may bring. God has it all under control. But I'm so thankful for when I walked into our teen class this morning and every single seat was full. Amen. That was awesome. I'm thankful this morning that when I look out here that from row to row, it's full of kids today. Yep. Amen. That's a really good blessing. And so I'm just grateful that one day, God reached down out of heaven and he pulled me out of a really bad situation. That's the love of a father. So maybe it's you today who was pulled out of that terrible situation and maybe you're just grateful for what God's doing in your life. Maybe you want to raise your hand today and just thank him while we're singing. Hey, it's a good day to do that. All my words fall short I've got nothing How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end. And you I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, I've got nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart. 
hallelujah and i know it's not a much i've got nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah we're gonna do a song we usually do this when we do communion I think it's fitting for today. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul. Isn't it awesome how God loves us today? Amen. I'm so thankful and blessed. So actually sing it like you mean it. <laughs> sing it how, like this is your love song to Jesus this morning. Let's do that together. What a mighty God we serve, and it's awesome what God is doing here at Mission Point. All right, a couple quick things. Hey, we got trunk or treat tonight. Yeah, yeah. that sounded like the Holy Spirit right there. <laughs> Y'all are excited about trunk or treat. Tiffany, where are you at? Can people still bring their cars if they signed up? You show up. We need everybody here. Listen, last year it was packed. And we've had years when it's packed and crazy out there. Bring a lot of candy, dress up, have fun. Tell somebody about Jesus, right, Pastor? Amen. Tell somebody about Jesus. Witness to somebody tonight. That's what we're going to do is let people know about Jesus. All right. Next week, we are super excited for the student ministries. If you don't know what student ministries is, that is our New term for youth group. Um, we are having a student ministries room dedication after church next Sunday, and you are all invited in there to pray over that room, and we're going to dedicate it back to the Lord. It's finished. I'm just happy about that. All right. Friendsgiving Fellowship is coming up. Did everybody like the fellowship last week who stayed for food? Yes, I like food. I know a lot of y'all do too. We had a great time. Thank you for putting that together. Uh, Friendsgiving Fellowship is going to be Sunday, November 3rd here at the Activities Building. Everybody is welcome to join us immediately after church service for a potluck. Y'all, I like the word potluck. That means that there's a lot of food and a lot of different things. So I need you all to pick one of these up out there or go online on Facebook or whatever, where Tiffany has this stuff posted, or else get your look at your email, please. That'd be awesome. But it will tell you what 
where your last name falls and what you should bring, okay? Uh, we got the Christmas cantata coming up. It's going to be December 22nd, and I am excited about that. But that means I need some people to sign up for a choir. After church out here under the missions TV, you're like, hey, I can, don't know if I make a joyful noise or not. I don't care. If you want to sign up for the choir, we'll take your joyful noise that week. So it's two weeks, sorry, it's almost two months of practice, but you're going to have the time of your life, and you might laugh a couple times. Um, that's right. Thanksgiving Eve uh, communion service uh, will be the day before Thanksgiving, which that's going to be November 27th. Can you believe it's already going to be Thanksgiving this soon? Doesn't that sound crazy? Uh, where did the time go? It's going to be at 7 p.m. that night. We're going to have a great time. Uh, Christmas dinners, if you are interested in donating for Christmas dinners, um, please see Tiffany as well for that. Hey, God is good this morning. Kids, are you ready to go to children's worship, kids' worship? You can all go. All right. Here and answer. Okay, sorry about that. I have one more. This is my mistake. Okay. Pam Atkins, can you raise your hand? I know you're in here. Okay, maybe she's out there. Okay. Pam Atkins, she is our director for LifeWise. They're doing a pasta fundraiser dinner, okay? Check with her after church to get one of these so you can actually help donate and get money, raise funds for our Madison program. It's $15 per ticket. Uh, you can buy them in advance. Um, you can pay cash to this if you fill it out, or else you can write a check to three girls and a kitchen. I guess that's what it is. Um, but please get with her. And this is all going to be uh, the dinner. Let me see here. It's going to be October 28th. Thank you, guys. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Matt. All right. Today we were going to have a special uh, service with Dwayne and Tammy Wright, our missionaries to Ethiopia. Um, unfortunately, uh, I talked with Dwayne and his daughter who was pregnant. He wasn't sure he was going to get back from Mount Kilimanjaro in time to be here, uh, but he did, and so everything was scheduled. But he didn't want to reschedule to maybe the 1st of November because his daughter was pregnant. Um, she's due within the next three weeks. And so, unfortunately, she, she went into some complications and different things. So she went into the ER on Friday, and he had contacted me and said that they were going to fly to Iowa to be with their family. And so um, be in prayer for the Wright family, W-R-I-G-H-T. Uh, Dwayne and Tammy Wright uh, to Ethiopia. And so I haven't heard. Um, he hasn't responded to me yet. I'm sure he's busy, and I'm sure he has a lot of people that are trying to contact him. But I, I don't know the situation, and I don't know the status yet uh, of uh, their daughter or, or the granddaughter, um, if uh, she has been born yet. So pray for the Wright family. I've also got a, another prayer request for... Devin Keith, uh, two first names, Devin Keith, uh, right, Rich? This is Rich Howard's son, this is Julia Howard's son, and they found out that uh, he was going deaf uh, for uh, uh, quite a while, and they found out that he has a tumor behind his ear that's pushing on his brain. And so they're going to do surgery on October 30th, this month, uh, so up and coming. And so if you could put Devin Keith um, also into your prayers as well um, for his upcoming surgery. Uh, I don't think that it's something that's dangerous. It's something they can get to and to remove the brain. I don't know if it'll bring the, the hearing back, but be in prayer uh, for them and the family as well. And we'll let you know how we can be a blessing to them. Okay, let's pray for those folks right now. Father God, we just love you, Lord, and we just thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, which allows us, the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, gives us boldness to come to the throne room and make our requests known. And so since we have access, Lord, we need to bring our requests to you. We lift up the right family, Lord. You know what they're going through right now with their daughter um, in the ER with complications from 
um, uh, the um, pregnancy from uh, their, their daughter with the, the child, and you, you know what it's going to take. We pray as, uh, I pray God as we're praying right now that uh, the child has already been born and they have a healthy granddaughter and, and things are well. We just don't know it yet. Uh, but that's what we ask, Lord, and we pray uh, that you'd be with the family and uh, during those times it's very gut-wrenching and nerve-wrenching. We pray for your peace and your comfort as only you can give them in their time of need, Lord. We pray for Devin. We pray for the surgery that's upcoming, Lord. We just ask that that tumor would be removed, uh, stop pushing on his brain, causing problems, and that his hearing would be restored and that you get the glory for it, God. But nevertheless, uh, whatever your will is, that's what we want. Uh, this is what we ask, but we ask your will be accomplished. And we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Continue to remember those folks in prayer. A couple of things before we get started. Um, number one, next Sunday, we're going to have a congregational meeting during the Sunday school hour. When is that going to take place? Say it again. Say it again. Okay, so we need all hands on deck because in all seriousness, when we vote on something in a church forum like this, in a congregational vote... Um, our Constitution says we have to have 50 people here. Um, so we need everybody here to understand what, what's going on. We've got some things that need to be accomplished. And so um, we, we want to make things happen. So we're going to explain all of this stuff um, next Sunday when we come together in great detail. So you have crystal clear communication about what we're doing. Uh, but there are some things that we need to vote on. Okay? So we need for you to be here. And so according to our Constitution, I'm to announce one week ahead of time, in which next week, when are we meeting? Where are we meeting? Okay, well, there you go. Sunday school hour, meeting right here. Make sure you let the folks know that aren't here today. Let them know throughout the week. We're going to get it out in an email. We're going to announce all that stuff, have it on Facebook, all of the things. Uh, so please uh, make sure that you're here. There might be a Christmas gift in there for you ladies. I'm just saying. Not the, you may like it. All right, two things. Number one, if I have these voter guides, these voter guides here, uh, please listen. This is not an issue of political party. This is a biblical issue. Um, and so what this does is this gives you all the account of not only the national selections, but the state selections in your districts. I'm not so much sure about the... Uh, um, the judges. But anyway, it'll give you biographies, it'll give you backgrounds, it'll give you organizations they believe in, don't believe in, all that stuff. Be informed. Um, Hosea 4 6 says, My people perish for lack of information because they don't know. Be informed. I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but be informed. Vote biblically. Vote biblically. Get out and vote. Yes. Um, God is sovereignly in control, and whatever his will, it'll be done, but we still need to do our part. Amen? Amen. That thing's coming up, and so enough of that. We're not going to talk about that no more. This is Missions Emphasis Month, and so um, we are doing faith promise giving, uh, just like we've done for <laughs> not to quote Tom Crap, but since Moby was a minnow, um, and so that's been a long time ago. But the idea is that we come every year in October, this is our missions emphasis month, we focus on missions, and then what we do is we try to have some type of faith promise to step out to give to missions above and beyond your tithe and offerings, so that we kind of know if we can take on new missionaries or not, and so this is a one-year uh, one commitment. Uh, this is between you and God, it has nothing to do with us, this is between you and God, and so all we're asking if you did not get a card coming in today, uh, let me know. We'll have cards readily available. Doug, raise your hand, Doug. Do you have more cards left? Okay. Doug will be out in the lobby after service, and he'll hand you a card if you did not get one this morning. All we're looking for is what you uh, commit to give per week. And so everything is based off of a, a weekly basis, and so we, we see that coming in. Uh, if you just put down a month, just put down what that is per week. That way we can do it, or just say a month, whatever. But it is per week, that's what we're doing. And that way it figures up if we can bring on new missionaries. Would you love to support new missionaries? 
Listen, we get raises every year in our jobs, don't we? Well, some of us do anyway. Some don't, but it'd be nice to give the missionaries a raise too, right? Some of these people have been there for 20, 30 years, and they, they haven't got a raise at all. It'd be good to give some of those uh, a raise as well, because cost of living goes up in those countries, which are much higher than ours. And so don't forget about your Faith Promise giving cards. Uh, if you don't turn them in this week, next week we'll be collecting them um, after the service. How's that? If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Since Dwayne wasn't here, I got the service this morning, so if uh, you can't stand my preaching, I'm sorry, but uh, you just have to deal with it. Open your Bibles to John chapter 17. We're talking about making a difference in the world. And so what, what's the difference? By dictionary definition, difference is uh, not the same. It is something that is unlike in nature, it's unlike in form, and it's unlike in quality. Uh, and so those, those are, are, are differences or different. And uh, I remember, oh gosh, this thing still sticks with me. Stupid Sesame Street. Remember watching that dumb thing and that song would come on? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. Yeah, see, your kids are listening to you too. One of these something, something, something before the end of this song. And so you'd have to pick out what was different. And so you'd look at there and you'd see all these four balloons and so forth. And the four of them are red and one of them's blue. And you're like, oh, it's a different color. Uh, and so you're, you're always trying to think and, and, and pick out that. And, and it's, something, it's something that we try to do. We, we try to be different. And so when the church is to be different than the world, we want to make sure that we're trying to be not the same, different in quality, different in form, different in anything. But you got to be careful when you do stuff like that because we don't necessarily want to put legalistic standards on things. Because what we have done in the past is, is we have said, well, um, Christians are going to wear suits and ties. And then the ladies are going to have dresses. And in some denominations, the ladies had to have their head covering, so they wore the little doilies on their hair, you know, and little pins in them and so forth. And Okay, that's cool. But that's not what the Bible says separates us from the world. Because businessmen wear suits to work, right? So what difference are you than the world? So there has to be something different biblically that God is giving us. And that's what we want to make sure that we are unified in message and purpose. That's what Christ wants us to be. And, and, and unity is important. I get, missionaries call all the time and they're uh, coming in to give an account or to uh, present their ministry. And they're like, what do you want us to wear? And what translation are we supposed to use? <laughs> and they're like, wow, okay. And they're like, hey... Some of those are important. Uh, one missionary in Pennsylvania asked if I cared what his wife wore to bed. And I, I said, why the heck would I care? The... He said, because I was denied being a missionary in this church because my wife wore pajama bottoms that had two legs. That pertains to a man, and we're not supporting you. Let me tell you, people are different. But you can't put that kind of legalistic standard on Christianity and say, this is what's Christian. we got to have something that comes from the Bible. God wants us to be unified in message and purpose. And we need to know what that purpose is. We need to know what separates. Why, why does the world hate Jesus so much? Can I tell you something? There's only one Jesus that the world hates. Now, let me, let me just... Uh, don't. Don't get shook. Let me justify what I'm talking about. The world doesn't hate little baby Jesus in the manger. The world doesn't hate little baby Jesus in the manger. Because when it comes to December, when it comes to Christmas time, I think it's after Halloween now. As soon as Halloween's done, I think Christmas stuff goes out. We used to have fall and we used to have Thanksgiving in the corner. It's just, it's all done. We used to wait till, th how many of you still wait till after Thanksgiving to put up your Christmas tree? Oh, there's a bunch of you. Okay, I thought it'd be different than that. That's okay. That's all right. Some people just leave their tree up all year long. How many of you have lights all year long on the outside, on the gutters? <laughs> I love you, Doug. <laughs> oh, God love you, Doug. That's awesome. <laughs> 
It's just usability, man. We shouldn't be on ladders, should we? That's, that's good logical thinking right there. Anyway, here's, here's the idea. When we talk about Christmas time, the world doesn't hate little baby Jesus in a manger because it's big business. Billions of dollars are spent on Christmas. And this is, this is what we have because little baby Jesus, guess what? You know what they do? They have little Santa, and little Santa's kneeling down at the manger with little baby Jesus. Oh, that's so cute. No, it makes me sick. Oh, crap, no, I can't get up. (laughs) Forget. (laughs) That is tough getting old. Sorry you had to hear that. All right. (laughs) Pray for me. They were supposed to be fixed. Please pray that God doesn't have another one. I can't do another one. <laughs> if your knee sounds like that, you might be getting old. But <laughs> if you don't have something nice to say, Thomas. <laughs> so here's the issue. The world doesn't hate baby Jesus. The world didn't hate the adult Jesus. Matter of fact, the world didn't hate Jesus because he healed the sick. The world didn't hate Jesus because he turned water into wine. Matter of fact, probably more people would probably like that today. The world didn't hate Jesus because he fed people with a couple little fish and some bread. The world did not hate Jesus because he walked on water and died on a cross. The world hated Jesus by Jesus' words himself. According to John chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus says this, the world cannot hate you, but the world hates me because I testify that its works are evil. Jesus said, I'm telling the world and its system that everything it does is evil. 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 Today we're supposed to be tolerant of everything. And that, that's a problem because you're not supposed to say that anything is evil. But Jesus said, I'm telling you, your works are evil. And the problem with today's society is you can't call sin a sin. You ever heard that? That's sin. Well, we, we can't say that. We have to use a different term. They're just, they have problems. No, that's sin. They're a sinner. Not only does the world hate Jesus because he testifies their works are evil, but the world hates Jesus because of his mission, what he came to accomplish. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, um, John writes this, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. But the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's why the world hates Jesus, because he said, your works are evil, and he came to destroy those works. People don't want to give up on their sin. In John chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus says this, here's the judgment. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light, because their works are what? Evil. Evil. Let's pray, and we'll, 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 get into our, we'll get into our message this morning. Tom Craft, you need to pray for us and yourself. Amen. If you're there in John chapter 17, look at verse 17, 17 through 19. John writes this. He says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So we see that the word of God is true. Jesus said we're to be sanctified in it. And he said, you have sent me into the world. And so I send them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. We're sanctified by God's truth, 
And the truth is everything that God has communicated to us in his word. The message that Jesus gave, that the disciples heard, they believed it. They understood it. And the disciples' hearts and their minds, it, it captured them. And that changed the change in their thinking, that's repentance, change of thinking. The change in their thinking resulted in a change in their living. And the same thing holds true for us today. As we appropriate the word of God to our lives, we are being set apart to God. And, and when the word of God changes our minds and our hearts, it also changes the way we live in order that we can honor God. The whole purpose of a Christian is to give God glory. And we want to honor God. And so the word of God does that. In John 15, verse 3, Jesus said, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Not only is this the written word, but it's the spoken word. Isaiah tells us that God's word will not return unto him void. Amen? I mean, written, spoken, whatever. You know what I'm doing this evening? I got some old tracks that I found. I'm going to hand out some old tracks. I'm going to pray over him and say, God, I'm going to tell him about Jesus. Uh, I wanted to be like a little taco. And then they say, what are you supposed to be? And I go, I'm a taco. You want a taco about Jesus? <laughs> See that? That'd be a way to introduce us. Uh, you could taco about Jesus. I don't know. Anyway. But I'm going to give little tracks. The written word, the verbal word, it doesn't matter. God's word's not going to return void. Get it out there. Get it out there. Do something. Do something to get it out there. And so, but it's going to change your heart and mind. The word of God will change your heart and mind and then allow you to go change the way that you live. Uh, and we are, we're cleansed by the word of God. And that's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 20 or 21, where he says, God wants clean vessels so that he can be used. We need to be useful for the master's use. And it's only clean vessels that the master will use. And so, back to John 17, look at verse 20. Jesus says this. He goes, this is his prayer for not just the disciples, but I want you to see more than that. This goes through the future of time. This is future tense, and he says, I don't just ask for these disciples that are right in front of me. He says, but I, I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. I love this because their word was God's word, and God's word is timeless, and it says it'll, it'll never, uh, you'll never be able to destroy God's word. That's uh, what Satan has tried to do. He's tried to burn, ban, outlaw everything through the course of history, and it's never happened. And we still have God's completed word absolutely 99.9% .9 accurate the way it was written in its original. That's the beauty of God's word. It's timeless. And so the message that they gave is what we still give today. Jesus prayed that those folks in the future that would still hear the same word that the disciples preached, that they would come to the saving knowledge of him as well. We all need to be giving the same message. Uh, that it's important. But it's not just the message. It's not just the gospel. The world hates Jesus because... He testifies their works are evil, and he came to destroy the works of the devil. I fall short in displaying Jesus because I'm not like him. I'm not perfect. Jesus in John 7, he, he said, why, why, who are you to convict me of sin? I've done nothing wrong. What do you want to stone me for? Why do you want to kill me? I've done nothing wrong. I'm sinless. And they had nothing to charge him with. He was an innocent man. But the problem that I have is when I try to display Jesus, man, that's why they hate me. I'm giving them the gospel, but sometimes I may not do it the way I'm supposed to. Maybe I don't. We're supposed to preach the truth out of love, right? I'll hammer the truth. But I may not do it in love. And that's why they don't see Jesus through us. We, we, we fail. But listen, in John 1, 14, John says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we beheld his glory as the only glory from, uh, as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We need to have that gospel message, but I think we also need that grace that goes along with it. We need the grace and the truth. Amen? That's what Jesus said. He is grace and truth. And we need to remember that. Listen, the world hated Jesus because he said that their works are evil. That's what we're saying. You you don't match God's standard. You're a sinner. (laughs) They don't want to hear that. So we need that same kind of grace along with that truth. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 19 this. Rather speaking the truth in love or uh, out of love, either way is acceptable. Speaking, speaking the truth, but it has to be out of love. But more than, but more than just love, I, I, I love, thank you for including that hymn. That's awesome. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. It should be done with grace and truth and in love. That's amazing. So our message, the gospel message, needs to be the same. We all need to be unified. Look at verse 21. He says, they need to give the same message. There's people that are going to get saved in the future. And he's praying for those that are going to get saved in the future. He says, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Can I tell you something? How does the world know that we were sent by Jesus when we are unified? Unified in purpose and unified in our message. Now, here's what Jesus said about purpose. How are we unified in purpose? Well, here it is. Look at, skip down to verse 24 through 26. (laughs) Jesus says this. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. And then he goes on in verse 25 to say, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, it says, I know you. I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. We're to be unified in purpose to show the love of Jesus through us, to the world. Now, that may be confusing. We talk about love. We talk about love. We talk about love. And so, this is, uh, matter of fact, this is a command. Jesus says in John 13, 34 to 35, he said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, the entire world, all nations, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for another. Why? Because God is love. We shed God's love. Romans, uh, 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 I believe it's five, which says, or no, I'm sorry, Romans eight, where it says that God's love has been poured out on our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to you. We have been given God's love. God is love. I don't know love because I need to see God. That's what Jesus said. Father, I'm in you, you're in me, they're in me, and, and the love that you had with me when we were in the beginning, let, me, let them see that love so that they see you and know that you sent me and that I'm sending them. It's a message of love. I, I'm not sure that we get this sometimes. We're to be disciples of Christ to shed love. Doesn't mean we're a doormat. Doesn't mean we get walked all over. Doesn't mean any of those things. But it does mean that we're to shed the love of Jesus. Satan doesn't teach his children to love. Um, and there is a difference, no, between... Satan's children and God's children, right? John chapter 8 said, you're of your father the devil. So he has children, and then God has children. You have to be born again. You have to be redeemed. You have to have redemption. Born of the Spirit. Now you're adopted into God's family. Now you're a child of God. So there's a difference. But Satan does not teach his children to love. He teaches them to murder and to stir up hatred. Because only God is love for John 4, 19, Right? And so what is the difference about us than the world? Lots of things. But we need to show these different things. 
I've used this uh, before, and I, I want to give it to you again because some of our younger generations have no hope. And they said, I'll never get married, and I'll never be able to have children because climate change will destroy this world. Do you know how sad that is? How unhopeful that is in this universe? That our world is going to come to an end and then there's nothing else. You know, it's kind of funny. I think atheists think that everything started from nothing. And then guess what happens when you die? You go back to your creator. Nothing. Same thing holds true for Christianity. We were created and we go back to our creator. But Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 6, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the way you know. Tom said, we don't know the way. And he said in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. Man, if only we had purpose, meaning, and hope in this life. Oh, we do. And hope's name is Jesus. We, we need to show this to a lost and dying world. They don't have hope. We need to show them that they have hope. We need to, if I had a $100 bill right here, would you want that? I'd say, who wants a $100 bill? Who would want it? Everybody. Now, if I crumbled it up and I threw it on the ground, would you still want it? Okay, if I stepped on it, would you still want it? Do you know why you'd still want it if I did all those things? Because it still has value. And I don't want to get into this, but I understand that we are enemies of God apart from Christ, Romans 5.10. I understand Psalm 5.5, God hates the workers of iniquity. But there's something of value with human beings to God because we're the only thing in creation created in his image. And he thought it important enough for him to die for us, to buy us back, to redeem us only. And that's the beauty. That's the message that we need to be given. People have value. God loves you, man. Isn't God's love awesome? Sometimes you wake up, you're having a bad day. I'm telling you, sometimes the only thing that'll get you through the day is that God loves me. When everybody else is putting you down and you can't do good enough and things aren't happening and stuff's going all around, to know that God will never leave me nor forsake me. And his love surrounds me and fills me with joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's, that's so amazing. Life is worth the living just because he lives. That's the love of God. That's what we need to shed to a lost and dying world. Listen, let me go through this. Why doesn't the world want to believe in Jesus? Why do they hate him so much? Why don't they want to come to him? Well, let me give you some things. I've stole this, I love this, and I will preach this until the day I die or I find out that I'm wrong. God does not need help defending. People need help in their understanding. It's not God's problem. Because listen, if nobody says anything about God, creation, Romans 1, and your conscience, Romans 2.15, say that there's a God, and those two verses say that everybody is without excuse. I don't need to defend God. Creation does. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Night after night, it utters speech. It proclaims there's a creator. And if you don't know that, just look up. And if you can't come to that knowledge, that's on you. And there's a moral law. Everybody knows right and wrong in here by the moral code God has given everybody, Romans 2.15. And everyone is without excuse. God don't need help defending. People need help in their understanding. And that's our job. Let me give you these quickly. We're running out of time. I thought we'd be done early. Let's, um, hmm. Let's tell the folks in the back we got another 45 minutes so we'll be good. That'll make the nursery workers mad. Why don't people want to accept Jesus? Number one, some people don't think they need a savior. Those people consider themselves to be basically good. They don't realize 
like uh, we're all sinners, like everybody, and you're not going to come to God on your terms. It's going to be on God's terms. Listen, we need to get people to help understand Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is the epitome of perfection. God is good. Well, I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. Well, you help people understand. According to Luke chapter 18, verse 18 through 19, Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And if God is the uh, uh, perfection, everybody else falls short. That's why perfection is seven, and then the number of man is what? Six, because six falls short of seven. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. We need to get people to see that. They're not intrinsically good. That's why you don't teach a child to be disobedient. You teach them to be obedient because naturally they're disobedient. Amen? Okay, why? Help them. Help them understand. Number two, fear of social rejection. There's a lot of Christians that get ridiculed throughout the world. They get ridiculed in our America. They get ridiculed in our city. It doesn't matter. Some people don't want to come to Christ because they don't want to get ridiculed for him. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed for the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God and it's salvation for everybody who believes. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. I'll give him to you. But, but here's the idea. Some people don't want to do that. Matter of fact, in John chapter 12, I believe it was, 42 and 43, you'd have to look it up. But there were some people that, that, that said they believed in Jesus. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But they would not open their mouths because they didn't want the Pharisees to kick them out of the synagogues. And they did not want to lose their social status and their social position. I think paraphrased in the Zedeker translation, it says something to the effect, they love to get the glory from men instead of have the glory from God. I'd rather have the praise of God than the praise of men. Your social status isn't going to mean nothing one minute into eternity. One second into eternity. Number three, for some people, the things of this world is just more important than all eternity. And Jesus says, what, what is it going to do to, that you gain the whole world and lose your soul in hell? What good is the world going to do you? And number four, many people are resisting the Holy Spirit's convicting power. Uh, to draw them to Christ. This is sad. Um, a verse that I believe denies um, irresistible grace in a Calvinistic style. They say that God forces you to come and, and you can't resist it. But in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen's being stoned and he's trying to tell all those people and he's, he's giving them a, a defense of Jesus and he's like, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Stiff neck, uncircumcised the heart people. That's a big uh, rejection for them. People are always resisting. Listen, we give them the truth. Grace, truth. We give them the gospel. We do what we can out of love. John 16, Jesus said it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them they're a sinner. I can't force anybody except Jesus. But I can show the love of God. I can show how awesome God is. I can show going through circumstances, God will never leave you nor forsake you. I can show you through things that happen in life how awesome God truly is to be a child of his. And that's what we need to show those folks. Whatever the reason people reject Christ, we're here to help them understand with grace and truth. Give them understanding. Salvation may come by your fruitful efforts. Jesus said uh, in, in John 10, 16, that I've got sheep that are not of this fold. We know people are going to get saved today. Matter of fact, we're waiting on the last member to be a part of the church so Jesus can come back and get us. Amen? We don't know who that is. That may be somebody out in our parking lot. You may be the one that witnessed to him, lead him to the Lord, Jesus saves him, and then we go home. So let's get busy. Get your tracks out. Put your little taco outfit on. Let's taco about Jesus so we can go home. Amen? Be a little more kingdom-minded in our mindset. Do it? All right. All right, we're doing this. We're going to go over five minutes now, and I'm really going to get hurt. There was a professor 
who came into his class in the first of semester. It was his first brand new class, brand new fresh. And he come in, he looked at a woman, and he said, what's your name? She said, Alexis. He said, okay, Alexis, I want you to pack your stuff, and I want you to leave, and don't ever come back to my lecture room again. And she looked at him, and she said, uh, well, uh, what? I don't understand. And he said, I'm not going to tell you again. And so she got up, packed her stuff, and she left the room. And everybody around is just like going, what in the heck is going on? And so the professor said, why do we have laws? And they him hauled around, and somebody finally said, to protect against injustice. And he goes, good. What I did to that woman, was that just? Everybody said, no. And then he said, why didn't you open your mouth? Why didn't you stop the injustice? If the laws are there to protect people from injustice, why didn't you step up and say something? He said, I have just showed you by experience something that you will never be able to learn in a thousand lectures. If you don't say anything because you don't think you're affected, then that kind of attitude speaks against us and speaks against life. If you don't think that things around us don't affect us, then we're wrong. We need to step up and speak. I use that he's talking about injustice, but I'm talking about getting the gospel out. You don't think that that affects us as well? You don't think the people around us, if you're not going to get out and show the love of God, you don't think that's going to uh, affect us? Can I tell you something? If everybody knew Jesus Christ and we were all filled with the Spirit, this world would be perfect. Hello! But more and more and more and more, people are walking away. Listen, John 15, 8. Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be disciples. Bearing fruit for the kingdom is witnessing for folks. Saving people from hell. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 says, we implore you on behalf of Jesus, be reconciled back to God. We're his representatives. We're his ambassadors. Edmund Burke said this, this is the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for men and women to do nothing. To do nothing. Proverbs 24, 11 says, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. Man, we, we may be their last hope. We may be their only hope. If we are the mouth of Jesus, then we need to, by grace and truth, out of love. 2 Corinthians 5.20 we implore you on behalf of Jesus, be reconciled back to God. People need help in their understanding. And we need to be there to help them understand how good and loving God truly is for them. What he would do for them. To help them in addiction. To help them in a lifestyle. To help them in whatever the case may be. Do you not think that God can't help and if you think he can, then give it to somebody. Give God to them in grace and truth out of love. Give them the gospel. I don't deserve heaven and eternal life, but by God's grace, I have it. Nobody else deserves it either, so it's not for me. Listen, we need to get the gospel out. Whatever it may be, whatever the case may be, we need to help people understand they're a sinner. Help redirect them back to God. We can't force people, but you sure can help them in their understanding. Let's help them understand how good God is and his love. God is love. And if you have God's love, then you ought to be expressing that love for others. Let's bow for prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for our time today. We love you, God. And we know that it's not just because we love you, but you first loved us. You loved us, you died for us, you gave us your son to bring us back to you in that right relationship. And so, God, may we be your representatives. We, 
We are still in a sinful mindset in our flesh, but we, we can be in the Spirit, and we can get it right, and we can, by grace and truth, love people and tell them about your Son and how good you are to us, Father. And may we do that. We have an opportunity today. We have an opportunity tomorrow. We have an opportunity the next day. While we still have breath, we always have opportunities. May we be more mindful of bearing fruit for your kingdom. We love you, God, and we just commit our time to you. And if there is some need, any need, whatever it may be, let them leave it at the foot of the cross. This is your time, God, an invitation. We pray you'd have your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.